So the reason I'm presenting this case was because uh, this was supposed to be a straightforward case, but uh, ended up having uh, uh, one complication to another. Uh, this case was done about three years ago when I was a junior faculty at Scripps with uh, Curtis Tennis over there. So this is an 82-year-old female with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. She was referred to our uh, heart team for consideration of transcatheter aortic valve replacement. She had dyspnea on exertion and angina. Her STS score was 13.2. She had multiple comorbidities uh, with prior history of ischemic cardiomyopathy, recent and STEMI, multiple PCIs, peripheral arterial disease, COPD, chronic kidney disease, type 2 diabetes, and recent DVT. Uh, so this is her baseline echo. It's a tri-leaflet valve with some calcification. Uh, if you pay attention, there's a moderate amount of aortic insufficiency. Uh, her aortic valve area was 0.85 with a peak velocity of 4.1 and mean gradient of 42. And her EF was low normal. Her coronary arteries showed non-obstructive coronary artery disease and uh, patent stents. Uh, CT measurements, uh, her annulus was uh, showed an area of 369 millimeters square with a perimeter of 69.9. Her sinuses were between 28 to 31 millimeters. And if you uh, take a close look, there's not too much calcium on the valve uh, or the leaflets. Her STJ was 25 to 26 millimeter, and her ascending aorta was 26 to by 27 millimeters. Her coronary height was adequate uh, between 17 to 18 millimeters on the right and the left system, and her STJ was 20 millimeters. Uh, she had a diffuse peripheral arterial disease starting from uh, distal infrarenal abdominal aorta all the way into bilateral iliofemoral system. Uh, so the minimum measurements were between 3.5 by 4.5 uh, on uh, both the sides. And uh, this is her distal abdominal aorta, like concentric calcification all the way uh, with moderate stenosis. Uh, looking at her uh, subclavian and axillary, uh, right side was okay. The left system was borderline, but both of them had uh, osteal uh, calcification. So based on that, uh, our plan was to do a 26 millimeter evolute R valve through a left axillary approach. And uh, this was more than three years ago, so we were just beginning to do a subclavian perk axillary. Uh, 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 we were doing a cut down at that time. Uh, so you can see the left femoral axis there, diffuse calcification and stenosis of the iliofemoral system. Uh, we tried to advance our, uh, our 14 French cook sheet, uh, but it kept hitting the calcium on the uh, ostium of the subclavian, so we used a six millimeter balloon to dilate that. Uh, this is the deployment angle. So the deployment was pretty straightforward, and we tried to deploy high with the two millimeter depth, uh, and everything was fine. Uh, but then patients started having hypotension, and we took the picture, and this is what we found. So. There's obviously uh, <coughs> multiple issues with, with that. One is the valve has embolized aortic, and the second, the left main is obstructed. So uh, not a good situation. So a few seconds later, she had a V-fib arrest, uh, defibrillation, uh, CPR. Uh, so at this point, what we did was, the first thing we did was put her on cardiopulmonary support. We switched her six French arterial cannula, uh, six French uh, uh, she is to the arterial cannula, put a venous cannula as well, and uh, things uh, stabilized. And then we plan to snare the valve uh, to relieve the left main obstruction. So it's an 18 by 30 millimeter end snare. Uh, we pulled it as high as we could into the ascending aorta uh, through the uh, ax uh, axillary axis. Uh, and now there's, there's flow in the, in the left main. And then we decided to do another valve uh, through this valve. Uh, and, but there's, a, you know, when people are rushing, there was a poor load of the new valve. So, and then we, this is a third valve, so which was loaded correctly. And we, we did the deployment, and you can see this, it's a lower deployment, but, but acceptable. There wasn't significant uh, paravalvular leak, uh, and patient was, uh, doing okay with no rhythm issues. Uh, but, but the issue here is, if you look at this, there's, there's a leaflet of the embolized valve and the leaflet of the new valve, and the coronaries are arising in between uh, uh, the two, and we were not sure if 
the flow in the diastole would be adequate to perfuse the coronaries at this time. Uh, we decided to uh, put a palmar stent to uh, open the valve leaflets, uh, but the stent kept hitting the outer frame of the valve, so we torpedoed the 14 French sheath uh, with the balloon, and uh, this is a palmar uh, stent mounted on a 25 millimeter tie shack balloon, and we pulled the sheath back. Uh, it's important to position the stent properly because it, it foreshortens a lot when you deploy it, and uh, so we, we decided to deploy it under rapid pacing, and uh, it opened the leaflets, and this is the, the final result. If you uh, look at on the picture on the right, she had like severe pulmonary edema. You can see the uh, in the ET tube there. Uh, the final subclavian angiogram showed some dissection, but but good flow, which was left alone. Her uh, she she did well and was discharged uh, seven days later to uh, a rehab. Uh, she's doing well three years later. This is her echo at 30 days uh, with no significant uh, gradient or paravalvular leak, and she did not need a pacemaker. Uh, so in conclusion, I, I think we should be careful with uh, the borderline valve with less calcium and aortic insufficiency. And maybe we could have used two snares and one and snared high into the sending aorta. I don't know if that would have helped. And early use of cardiopulmonary support in patients with hemodynamic compromise uh, is the key. Thank you.